Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Uh, we're in the, the Epistle of Timothy. This is what was referred to as the pastoral epistles. There are three, 1st, 2nd Timothy, and Titus. As we said last week in our introduction, um, scholars disagree as to whether Titus or 1st Timothy were written first, but they were written within the same time frame. They were written, uh, you know, 63, 64 AD. All three of these epistles were written in that time frame. So give or take a month or two, which one was written first, we really don't, it just doesn't matter. You know, that kind of time frame. 2,000 years later, we're talking about three months. It just doesn't matter. So when we went ahead and covered Titus first, based on the people that, I, you know, the, the um, um, research I was doing, the one I came up with was Titus was written first. We can try, somebody can say, I can prove you wrong. It's okay. It's not a big deal. Well, you're not going to go to hell if you believe Titus was written second or first. That's just not going to happen. All right? Um, so we, we are covering the last two epistles of Paul. And that is First and Second Timothy. These are his... Uh, final writings that we have record of or that we have as far as the canon of scripture and they are to his number one and don't don't, don't take this wrong his, but his number one protege his main protege Titus was another protege but but Timothy was the closest to Paul and these are his final these are so you kind of look at this Paul knows he's going home and here are his final words to his to the pastor who'd be taking over uh, the brunt of a lot of the ministry that Paul had done so uh, there's a lot of important things here, okay? This chapter, the second chapter, deals with two main themes, prayer and the role of women in the church, okay? However, let's just, and when we get to the women part, understand culturally, you're talking about a very strongly male-dominated society and women coming into the church getting saved and becoming part of the kingdom of God and finding liberty in Christ, but maybe got out of hand and trying to extend that liberty into the cultural setting too quick. And so some of the things we, we have, may have said here uh, may be more to deal with what's going on in that church on a cultural issue more than the doctrine of women can't say anything in the church, you know, or they can't, you know, that kind of thing. So uh, if we just kind of take it in that light a little bit, understanding that there are cultural changes, and so, um, you know, you may go into an area um, and... Women can't, cannot come into the church, or women have to have their heads covered. We just can't go in there and snatch everything off the head and say, you're free. Things have to take time for revelation to come to the people, not because revelation hadn't come, but for them to get revelation. You don't want to kill what God's doing just because somebody gets upset over, you know. I mean, you may find out you're free to wear a short sleeve, you know, tank top to preach in. You can go in some cultures and we'll be ready to throw you out the front door if you do it. Now, and I know a lot of ministers now that we, you know, traveling ministers, depending on what church they're going, they'll ask you, what do y'all wear? Now, they might be perfectly fine to come in in a short sleeve um, polo shirt and preach. But there's some churches that go in, they won't even listen to them because of that. All right? Because their arms, they won't, they won't, they won't their, I, I knew preachers back in, in 30, 40 years ago that, that they, they could not wear a short sleeve shirt in any time. Because it was, it was, uh, it was uh, just uh, not the right, appropriate attire. Well, you can shut down a whole uh, venue of ministry by being stupid. Hello. So when we kind of get to this thing about the women, I think we more, we're dealing more along the lines, and this is some, some commentaries that, that are looking in this direction. I think we're dealing more along, a little bit along the line of a cultural issue that Paul was dealing with of, you know, this is a new church, these are babes, it's a male-dominated society for the women to get up and go, hey, I'm free in Christ, I got something to say too. It may not have been the time. They needed to grow and understand things and, get, and, and everybody had to come along together in the beginning of this thing. Okay? All right. Uh, Paul, uh, so Paul starts out here and, and writes to him, he says, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, okay, um, it's just setting prayer, prayer as a priority, okay, um, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. So we have here the four words that describe prayer, supplication, which is the basic meaning of request, it's not exclusively a religious word, but it, uh, made, uh, it's a request, request made either to God uh, or for a fellow man, okay? Um, it does connotate need 
In other words, supplication means that there's a need, or you're asking because of a need. Um, prayers differs from this. Supplications they may, may have been addressed either to God or man, but prayer is addressed to God alone. Okay, so supplication could be, uh, Jeff, could you run over and get me a glass of tea? I would like to have some iced tea to drink with my, my uh, preacher tonight instead of ice water. You know, that's a, that's a supplication. That's a request of a need. Well, you might think I don't need it, but I prefer it anyway. Uh, Dick Alley, is this certified amoeba free? Okay, it's certified amoeba free. All right. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And then the, the third thing is intercessions, which is a, it's petitions. Um, submitting a petition, usually on the behalf of another. You're petitioning an authority on behalf of another. So that's an intercession. You're, you're doing it in their stead. And then fourth um, is, so, so supplications, prayers, uh, intercessions, and then giving of thanks. So fourth type of prayer is thanksgiving. You know, we're always to give thanks, amen, uh, which is Eucharistus, T-S, Eucharistus, Eucharistus uh, which is where we get Eucharist from, uh, which is the communion table. And it's, and it, it's, it's um, not only asking for God for things, but giving thanksgiving to him for who he is and what he does. Amen? So we, we have supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks for all men. Hallelujah. We're to pray for people. Now, it does not say what to pray. It says you, the types of prayers, but you're to pray for all men. In other words, these are the different types of things you would be praying for men, okay? We are to pray for people. Now, we have guidelines in the Bible that we can see, you know, the eyes of their understanding would be enlightened. They may know hope of his calling, you know, may experience the power. We, we are to pray for people to pray for the salvation. If they're unsaved, we need to pray for the salvation. Next verse. Now, there's a lot of charismatic word of faith people that have dealt difficultly with this one under the current administration for kings and for all that are in authority. Now, does that mean we pray, Lord, let him have his way? No. We pray that you, the eyes of his understanding be light. Or... If the, if the leadership or authority is operating contrary to the wholesome doctrine, you pray that God stay their hand and, and inhibit their ability to carry out evil. Okay? And if you don't know how to pray, pray in the Holy Ghost. Intercessions. Amen? Hallelujah. Why? That we may lead a, a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and Honesty. We want a quiet and peaceable life, don't we? Anybody here that doesn't want a quiet and peaceable life? Okay. Anybody here that does want a quiet and peaceable life? Okay, I got two, three, four, five, six. I right, got everybody. Okay, rest of the room. All right, rest of the yeah, so, you know, Sometimes you just ask questions. I ask the opposite question to find out if you're listening. You know? All right. Um, so we wanted to lead a quiet and peaceable life in all um, peaceful life in all honesty, godliness and honesty. Amen. Now the word godliness contains a dual meaning. It is a meaning of reverence for God and respect for man. Godliness means you have a reverence for God but a respect for man. All right. Hallelujah. Honesty uh, really means reverence, dignity, seriousness, respectfulness, holiness. A uh, proper sense, maybe a better meaning of this statement is a proper sense of seriousness of life. So we may lead a, 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 a light, quiet, peaceful life in all godliness and with a proper respect or sense of the seriousness of life. You know, too, too many people have no, no respect for the seriousness of life. Young people, you know, just this past week, on, um, see, I, I substituted for, uh, on Monday, I substituted at Wesley on Monday. The kids were in, in, the, uh, in the fitness room, up in the weight room, and uh, they were talking about this young kid who just graduated from one of the local high schools this past, um, past year. He was a, it was a, so he graduated in 2015. East Chester, 1.30 in the morning, head on collision, killed a 35-year-old man, driving drunk, driving on the wrong side of the road, at his age, I don't think he's supposed to be out that late. 
Well, maybe he's got three years after he turned 16. So maybe he was. But, you know, it had underage drinking, under the influence, wrong side of the road, and killed somebody. See, we don't, we don't have respect many times for the seriousness of life. That doesn't mean you don't live life and enjoy life, but, you know, you, we've got to have respect for it, though. Amen? Now, what, he, he's probably facing manslaughter minimum, okay, and all the other charges, you know. You know I mean, they could, they, could, they could unload a bunch of stuff on him. Purchasing alcohol underage, underage drinking, driving the wrong side of the road, um, manslaughter or vehicular homicide. Uh, I mean, all of that's in, in there. I mean, 18, 19-year-old kid, he could be going away for a good 30 years plus. We need to have, a, have respect for the seriousness of life. Amen? Hallelujah. And not be foolish. We, we, we have a generation that they think everything about doing anything they can to ex, that you go to the extreme of the seriousness of life. We know, we know of, a, of a young man who um, liked to, to ride on a longboard and not wear his helmet. You know, longboards are long skateboards. Okay, and uh, ride down hills on, but didn't want to wear his helmet. I've been told by by the by the family a number of times, you need to wear your helmet. Need to wear your helmet. Need to wear your helmet. Well, you can get about forty five miles an hour on this particular hill on your longboard, and boy, went after money, hit his head back on the curb. It killed him. He died a few days later, but it did, ended up killing him. You know, because it wasn't cool. I don't. I, I guess. I guess. It wasn't cool to wear the helmet. You know, but the thing is, you know, if we have more of a respect for the seriousness of life, we, there were some things you probably wouldn't do. He could have still enjoyed the, the longboard, but just put the helmet on. It would have saved his life. I said it would have saved his life. He wouldn't be dead. The, the kid, out, if, he, if he had understood that you don't drink and drive, you know? But it was, it was cool going out and doing it with his buddies, and there he is. Now the 35-year-old man is dead. So there are things in life that we need to have a sobriety about in life. And see, when we're praying, you know, and that's, that's, we don't teach these things in church anymore, but if, we're, if we got our kids praying, and we're praying, and we're praying over the, right, the right way, amen, so we can live peaceful lives with godliness, that is, that is uh, reverence for God and respect for man, and live um, in uh, uh, godliness and honesty with a, with a proper respect for the seriousness of life, we, we, things will go better for people. Amen? Hallelujah. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Remember this phrase, God our Savior, is used four times in and in, only and in, the three pastoral epistles. <clears throat> Who will have all men to be saved? Now, this is not universalism um, and to come to the knowledge of the truth. God's will is everybody gets saved, everybody comes to the knowledge of the truth. That's not what happens, because we know from other scripture that men don't all accept the, don't accept the truth. Jesus even said that people would be cast into outer darkness with his weeping and gnashing of teeth. Amen? So God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to the knowledge of the truth. That is God's will. Now, now let me say something here. This, this will mess up your, your, your uh, sovereign theology in a heartbeat. Because the other scripture plainly tells us that there are people who will be cast, that, that will cast into the lake of fire, and that's the eternal death, who will not go to heaven. Scripture plainly tells us there'll be those, the people who do not receive Jesus are, are damned. Scripture plainly tells us there's people not going to get saved. Yet, it's God's will that everybody gets saved. Well, how can it be God's will for everybody to get saved and people not get saved? Because God gives man the right to choose whether they accept his will or not. You have people who believe that everything happens by the will of God. No, it does not. Things happen many times. It's particularly bad things because people rejected the will of God or didn't do God's will. Thank you for your enthusiasm. You know? They didn't listen to the Holy Ghost. I'll tell you... Uh, if we'd listen to the Holy Ghost more. Amen. I've seen people make choices that didn't listen to the Holy Ghost. It, it, it cost them in the long run. All right. So God's will is everybody be saved. Not everybody gets saved. How do you know? Jesus even talked about in the book of Revelation that, that whoever's name was not blotted out of the Lamb's book of life. Well, who got blotted out? Those who didn't receive. 
Why? Because God's will was everybody get saved. So he went ahead and wrote all the names down. Some, were, you know, they don't get, you don't get your name written down the day you get saved. Your name was written down the day he was raised from the dead. And sat down at the right hand of the Father. Everybody's name was written down. And then those who died without receiving, his, receiving Jesus, without receiving the, 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 co- the, blood, uh, the blood of the covenant, they get blotted out. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Why, Jesus had become a man. He was God. He was man. He became God, the God-man. He was God. He stripped himself of his rights to deity and the glory. He took on flesh, became a man, and walked among us. And he was raised up from the dead, and God made the covenant between him and the man, Christ Jesus. He never saw, he never, he's, he's still God. He was, he's, a, he's still the second person of the Godhead. He was not some created being subs- subsort- subservient or subordinate to the Father. He is co-equal with the Father. I and my Father are one. Hallelujah. Who gave himself a ransom from, for all to be testified in due time or in the fullness of time. Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not. And a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. Now what Paul's saying here is, uh, Paul, this, this, is, this is a letter to Timothy, what we would kind of call a semi-private letter. It was going to be read by other people. So Paul establishes his authority here, thus establishing Timothy, since Timothy is his protege. Amen. Amen. And so Paul says, I'm a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and in verity. Praise God. He says, I will therefore that men... uh, Pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubt. This wasn't, I wish, this is a command. I want people, I command people everywhere to lift up your holy hands without wrath and without doubting. Praise God. Everywhere could be understood as, as also saying in every place or everywhere, you know, everywhere, every place. Um, we're to pray in all circumstances. That means it doesn't, just when it's good. You know, we can't not only do the things we need to do when it's good. Matter of fact, you, that's when you don't need, that's when you probably need to do it the least. We do it opposite. When it gets tough, we stop. When it gets good, we do it. That's really opposite. When it's tough is when you need to be doing stuff. Amen. More, don't, see, then you get some, ah, if you would just, I'm not, I'm not trying, what I'm, the point I'm trying to make is we don't need to quit doing the right things when it gets tough. We need to continue being consistent, doing the right things all the time. Amen. Without wrath and without doubting. The word doubting could be better translated disputing or dissension. Lift up your holy hands, amen. Uh, praying, lift up your holy hands without wrath and without dissension or disputing. You know, we, we, we use doubting a lot, but I mean, we, we kind of understand doubting to mean that without lack of faith. Here you say it actually means dissension or um, disputes. We don't need to be constantly disputing things, do we? We don't need to be constantly uh, fighting against the things of God. We don't need to be constantly working against God. We need to be working with him. We don't need to be working against our brothers and sisters. We need to be working together. Hallelujah. Now, he transitions here just a little bit. Um, He begins to address the women's appearance in public. Now, I just read on Facebook today. A, um, one of my friends, they had, a, they had somebody that knows them real well, they, and, they, and they went to their church for their pastor appreciation service this past weekend. So it was, or, or on the weekend, maybe it's Saturday night or something. They had a pastor appreciation thing. They had a, the, the pastor was a DJ. They played about 30 to 40 songs, none of them Christian. As a matter of fact, there was cussing and lewd, uh, lewd things in the songs. One of the leader's wives got up in the service, stood up in a chair, reached up and kind of grabbed the ceiling and started dancing like she was pole dancing. Now, this is a, what was, would be considered at one time a charismatic word church. Hello. Now, you know, the guy's, the guy's like going like, you know, he calls, he calls this other minister because he's, he's, tore, he's tore up. He was there in this thing and was just grieved. This is going on in the church. But see, 
that, that pastor is what some people refer to as a hyper-grace type church. You know, it doesn't matter what you do. You're under grace. You know, God loves you. God wants you to, you know, there's just no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You're, you know, uh, there's, no, there's no consequences for any of your actions. What example had they set to their congregation? Lewdness, you know, dancing and... Uh, I don't even have the right word to say it. Provocative, lewd um, ways of seduction in the church, and everybody just thinks it's great. Paul writes here, he says... In like manner also, that means, you know, lifting up holy hands without wrath and without dissension and disputing, um, <clears throat> that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair and gold and pearls and costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Now let's stop here. What's he talking about? Modesty, shamefacedness, and sobriety. And in this era, the women would, would spend hours getting their hair fixed, and they would actually have woven gold thread and silver and pearls all in their hair um, and so forth. Their, their apparel was, would be costly. You know, when they came to church, it was a show-out. Now, you've been in church and seen show-out too. Hello? And they were not... Adorning themselves with the right things, modesty. Now, folks, uh, women need to be modest. Now, I don't, know, I don't know how to say this any other way. If you don't come to church and let your shirt hang down so everybody can see everything that's inside the, the top of your shirt, hello, or your dress is up in the back end, my daddy used to call them Donald Duck dresses. It was up to your quack. <laughs> well, you got to remember, I came out of the 70s. You know, that was a mini skirts were the, were the order of the day. <clears throat> and then they, then they got to what they called the sizzlers. And they were so short, they had to wear a matching panty that, that was not panties over top of their panties that matched the sizzler short shirt, skirt. Then down there, you know, I mean, my kids are taking classes in college, and they're doing these these classes on, on respect. And it's, you know, um, if I run around naked and you, it's not an invitation for you to rape me, you need to control yourself. You don't need to be running around naked. <clears throat> in other words, I can do it. I, <clears throat> I have no responsibility in anything. I can do whatever I want, and it's your problem if you think. Listen, men are stimulated by sight. And if you're running around butt naked, you're going to stimulate them. Hello, I don't care. Don't tell me he's got a problem. God made him that way. Now, not to rape people, but you know, you've got, you've got to be modest. You can't just run around like that and just show out and then, and then tell everybody, it's your problem if, you look, if you're looking. Oh, you ought to be slapped. Hello, what if men dress like that? What if they wore Daisy Duke shorts? Well, they're not real men. Anyway. <laughs> walked around like that, you know. Come to church with a tank top on, lay down here with his, with his hairy chest showing and his gold jewelry. And the gray hair is mixing with the dark color. I mean, you just look nasty. Man walked in like I tell him, go put a shirt on and get out. Okay? But women, you can't just walk around like that all the time. And especially in church, it's not the place in the church. Hello? You're to be modest. Creflo had it really good. I mean, he said, I heard him say this a few years ago. He said, what you willing to show, you willing to share. That came from Creflo. I just copied, I'm just quoting Creflo there. Amen? But modest. That don't mean you got to wear something up to here. Hello? But I'm telling you, if you can't lean over two inches without showing your back end, your dress is too short. 
Hello? Are y'all here? You go home. Look, I've had them sit in the church sometime, you know, and, and, and not recently, but I've had people sit in church, and, and you're up here, you, and you, you had to preach like this. Because her dress is so short, when you look, I mean, if you look over that way, you, I mean, you look right at the dress. There ain't no sense in that mess. I said, there ain't no sense in it. Hello? So you're, you're preaching like this. That's right, preaching to the raptures. Amen. Modesty. Women should be modest. They should not be um, displaying themselves. Amen. Um, we're to be more interested in, ha- women used to be more interested in, in, in mod- actually, modern, modest means order, um, orderly or decent. Orderly or decent. There's, there's appropriate clothing for appropriate places. Hello? And some things people are wearing in public, the appropriate place is in the bedroom with your husband. That went over big. You ain't supposed to be showing yourself to the world. You know, have y'all ever gone in and seen where, where mallard ducks are? Have you ever noticed the mallard ducks, the female, is, it doesn't have, she has the, the tip colors on her wings of the male duck, but that's all she's got. She doesn't have the bright, uh, bright crest. She doesn't, you know, the, the, she, she's brown. Basically, it has the, the, the little uh, teal and white on her wings at one place, but the male has the bright crest. And other. Why? One, one thing is it was protection, uh, nature. It's protection. They can hide the, 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 the ducklings. His, his crest would, would tell off everything. Amen. Uh, you're not supposed to be out showing everything to every man. Well, you're just some kind of male chauvinist pig. Well, you go ahead and be stupid. Amen. You don't need to get your thrill out of turning other men on. Hello. Now you'd be orderly and decent. Moms, teach your children to dress correctly. We taught ours. My wife would say, no, nope, that was too short. But it's huh? Or she'd pull your shirt up. <laughs> well, there you go. Mama. <laughs> Hallelujah. So, well, but, but you, you have, parents, you've got a responsibility to teach your, teach your children. Moms, you've got a responsibility to teach your girls how to be modest. Conduct themselves in modesty. Hallelujah. Amen. I don't like that. Well, I don't really, don't, really don't care. I mean, I'm serious. I really don't care if you don't like it. That's the Bible. So if you don't like it, that's your problem between you and God. Go talk to him about it. Don't talk. Don't write me. Don't call me. Don't say I'm preaching meanness. God, God had Paul write it. Are you here? I said, are you here? <laughs> well, I got Jess here. Anybody else here? Hallelujah. Praise God. So, um, Modesty and shame face and, and the word shamefacedness means um, shamefacedness and sobriety. Uh, you, uh, the SC Bible says, use good sense and be proper. How about that? There to be, um, that women should make themselves attractive by their discreet, quiet, and modest dress. What? By the, by, how do they be attractive? Be attractive by the godliness that they, work, that they live in. By the good works that they perform. By the way they serve God. Amen. Now I know you can go to the other extreme. We you got to walk around with the death makeup on. You know the old white powder. At least in white Pentecostal churches they put the white powder on. All right. You know and the beehive hairdos and the, and the, and the uh, jean skirts down to your ankles. And they can't even move when they walk. All right. Okay you can go to extremes. We're not talking about doing extremes. We're talking about decent orderly, proper modesty. Amen. And somebody else say, hallelujah. So you're to be, um, uh, shame faces carries this idea of modesty, decency, godly fear. We're not talking about looking like death warmed over. That's what that, that's, that's my Pentecostal group got their thing. That, that shame faces, they, they put that powder on. 
because they couldn't wear makeup. That was Jezebel. They, they, get that, they get that dusting powder out and go, and they put that clear lip gloss on, and they put that hair up. We're not talking about that. But we are talking about being decent, having godly, being reverential, living in a way, and presenting yourself in a way that's not seductive. Hello? Well, how are you going to get a man? Why don't you get a man by being godly? You get a godly man. You go out that way, you might get the wrong man. Hello? I said, hello? You be got something that you don't want? Bring him home and say, oh my God, what have I done now? Too late. All right. So, um, verse back here in verse 9. And so, in like manner also, the women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shame faces, sobriety, that's decency, uh, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. You know, I mean, I think, I think uh, the president's wife, and I'm just saying this because it was in the news, they went to some dinner and she bought some $25,000 dress for a meal. Well, she needs to look good. You can look good for $23,500 less. Especially when it's my money paying it. Amen. I mean, I, somebody said, you need a hand tailor suit. They $1,500. I ain't, I ain't had one. Why? Because they're $1,500. I can look good for $500 or $400 or $300. Amen. But you know, the, the point here really is this here. It is... Um, that the women's address, that the women should be, uh, in general, he's saying that women should be about, give a silent witness by their modest dress and active good works. You don't have to be flashy. Hello, so you don't have to be flashy. You don't have to look like you know. I mean, I don't know. Just, just, just we get we get so carried away. So um, he said, don't have braided hair, golden pearls, don't have expensive clothes. Um, these relate to the customs of the first century church. Women spent hours fixing the long hair, fa uh, fastening their plaits with ribbons and brightly colored bows. Rich women interweaves gold and silver and pearls in their hairstyles. It's very likely expensive clothes were outlandish in style and color, drawing undue attention to the wearer. See, we shouldn't be drawing undue attention. Now, some folks go to church for a fashion show. Now, y'all know I'm talking the right. They got a hat big enough to block three rows behind them. They come in in a show. God doesn't want you coming in in a show. Hello? Now, I guess if Elton John had been in the church, Paul would have probably said men too. You should remember some of his outfits from the 70s? Back when he was doing Benny and the Jets and stuff? The feather tops and the... Well, anyway, if you're outlandish in their dress. But men, men, didn't, men don't tend to do that anyway. Women can get outlandish in dress. Hello? So we don't want to do that. We want to be modest women. I'm, 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 people just loving this one. He says, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Let's have good works. Amen? Hallelujah. But um, let the women learn in silence and all subjection. I suffer not the woman to teach nor usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. <laughs> Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they can continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. Now, uh, here we have the, the latter part. Let the women learn in silence at home. Now, no, you, you know this. It's uh, the Greek word for woman, the Greek word for wife are the same word, okay? Let the women learn in silence with all subjection. That means uh, they had cultural things where people just talked in church. Leroy, what's he talking about? Well, do, go home and learn it. Don't, do, don't be doing that in church, all right? Um, Suffer not the woman to teach, nor usurp authority of the man, but to be in silence. Right, this is where we were talking about earlier. The culture was a very extremely man-dominated society at that time. These are Gentiles who are just coming into the kingdom. You can't overturn them in a night. You can't say, well, you're born again. You're, you know, um, 
one famous evangelist wife, she, um, she went over to us in foreign countries and saw how women were treated, came back to America and started trying to preach stuff about it and, and caused a lot of trouble in America. I mean, you go to Africa, let me tell you something, you go to Africa and see how women are treated, it'll make you mad. Uh, some of y'all have heard of Ed Elliott. Well, I know Ed personally. Ed, Ed's a good guy. I uh, love him. He, he loves the Lord. Done a tr- they, him and Laurie just did some magnificent work in South Africa. Not the nation of South Africa. South, the southern part of the continent. Uh, for a number of years there, uh, evangelizing crusades of 50, 60,000 people. Um, they'd have churches that had 87 people when they came into town, and they'd have 1,200 when they left. That's when John Nuzo went over and started holding pastors' conferences because they had to teach the pastors how to handle, you know, 1,500% growth in six weeks. Hello. But um, they, were in, they were in a church. You know, they, they did the crusades. They were also in churches. They were in a church one time. And there's a girl, uh, African-American girl from Chicago. And she'd come out to, to kind of go out on the crusade or whatever and be part of the crusade team. And uh, at, at the end of the service, she was down at the altar going, and just crying, oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You let my, my family uh, relatives, my ancestors come to America as slaves. He went down and listened to her and thought, what are you talking about? Why are you thanking God that your ancestors came to America as slaves? And, and afterwards, she got, he kind of got to calm down and started talking to her. And she said, I've seen how the women here are treated. I have a way different and better lifestyle. Well, in, in many of these cultures, they're slaves. Women are slaves. They, the man sits like a king, and the woman walks five miles with a bucket on her head to get water. And then brings it back five miles. Hello? They, they, they are at the behest of the man's request, no matter what it is. And they have no choice in the matter. Okay? Well, you go into that society and you see that, and then you come back to America and start preaching, you know, liberation. When women in America are free, I can tell you what would happen right now if Jeff told Melanie to get a bucket and walk five miles and bring him a bucket of water. He'd look like one of them cartoons with it over his head, his head through it, and someone back, a sound back and says, get it yourself. Am I talking right? Melanie don't want to answer. We, we know I'm talking right. You ain't gonna be, she ain't walking five miles because he, not ask her, told her. Woman, get him, go get my water. Okay? So you bring, that, you bring a message of liberation from, from that uh, and bring it to the wrong place and, and not, not let it work. Over time, you're going to cause pro- tr- trouble, trouble. So people are getting saved here in this culture. Very male-dominated. Women, women are sub, uh, subordinate roles in that society. So I don't, I don't, I'm not going to allow the women to teach or usurp authority of the man. Why, Timothy? I mean, Timothy, you, you, you teach this. Why? Why? Because you, you'll mess up everything we're doing in the church. Now, give them time to grow. Give them time to mature. Give them time to re- recognize that they're the handmaidens of the Lord, that they're, they're anointing of God, that they can be used of God too. And that, th- that will progressively change over time. Now, did you all know that the framers of the Constitution could not agree on one, it was one major area they could not agree on. Anybody know what it was? Slavery. When they were writing the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, they could not agree. They had the northern states, and they, had the free, they had the free states, and they had the slave states. So what did they do? One of the things they did was they put in the amendment process because they, they, they knew it would have to be addressed later. And their design and their desire was that through amendment to the Constitution, they would change it. They didn't want a civil war. But the process, they, they realized at that time, we, we have to get this Constitution together and unite these states, but we're not going to get past this issue right now. So what are we going to do? We're going to make sure we have an amendment process that later, when men have an opportunity and, and, and come to reason, that they're able to amend the Constitution and change this. Can't do it today. It's not going to be, it ain't happening today. And they knew it wasn't happening today. So they had, to, they had to set something in place so that it could take place later. I believe that's what Paul was doing here. He knew that women would, would grow. I mean, we have Philip who had four daughters who prophesied. Remember that? He didn't tell them to shut up. They didn't tell him to shut up. As a matter of fact, they, they, they prophesied around Paul. You know? They, 
Then tell them to shut up. In the right season, at the right time, there will be an acceptance. Amen? Without bringing disruption to the church. But for them, I believe this was a, this was a personal wisdom to Timothy at this time. Let, don't let the women preach and don't let them teach, have, have authority over the men. You know. Later, that's, later that's going to change. And it did. We've had some marvelously anointed women in the kingdom of God. Many, many, I mean, and in the past, in the past 120 years since Azusa Street, we've had numerous women anointed by the Holy Ghost. Historically, we've had them too. I'm just saying, anointed by the Holy Ghost who minister effectively, who, who walk in the power of God, the anointing of God. Because now it's not, it's not, it's not the same cultural setting as we had 2,000 years ago here in, in, in the city of Ephesus, in that region. Okay, so this isn't a cop out. It's just you know you got you got to understand why some things were written and what was going on for that statement to be made that may not be applicable today because that's not what's going on. Okay, so as you know, I suffer not to teach or to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. That means that women didn't have a voice, didn't hear from God, weren't weren't were anointed by the Holy Ghost. We just got an issue right now for the Adam was first formed. Then Eve, Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. She was in the transgression. He committed high treason. Okay? She should, notwithstanding, she be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness. Now, some people try to say that women, when they have babies, get saved. That's not what it's saying. Okay? All right? Um, hallelujah. Um, Praise the Lord. I think we're going to have to finish here and, and then get in next, next week we get into the office and role. Um, others th th say, think this statement means, because um, the word saved is, is sozo, but you know, it, it can mean delivered. Um, primary rendering to this verse is from uh, uh, other translations is that she'll be preserved or rescued um, during childbearing if she continues in faith. Okay? Not she's going to get born again. You get born again the same way everybody else gets born again. You confess Jesus is Lord. All right? Next week we're going to get into the office of the bishop. Now the word bishop, the word pastor, the word shepherd are used interchangeably through the New Testament. Okay? So if any desire the office of a bishop to be a pastor, he, and he desires a good work. <laughs> Hallelujah. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the giving online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.